Amen. Okay, we got lots to do. We're jumping right to Acts chapter 12. Pull out your Bibles, if you would, um, or, your, um, or your Bible app as well. Um, we're going to Acts chapter 12. Verse 1. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. And he had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. If you've been with us as part of this Acts series, there's been a lot of persecution against the church. A lot of it has come from the Jewish establishment. This is the first one that comes from the government. Herod begins to persecute people in the church, and specifically he goes after a man named James. James is special. Why? Because up to this point, several Christians have already died for their faith. We've already had martyrs. But up to this stage... The original 12 disciples of Jesus have gone untouched. It could have been believed at that time, probably was believed at that time. These miracle working super close to Jesus people are probably untouchable. When all of a sudden James, part of the inner circle, if you know the, know the scripture, he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. The three top disciples, James, John, and Peter. James has been killed with the sword, likely beheaded. This would have rocked the early church, their confidence. So verse three, when Herod saw how much this pleased, this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. Because if your polling numbers go up when you did the first thing, keep doing it, right? And so he decides to arrest Peter as well. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned Peter, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. He used four squads because there were four watches of the night. He wanted to make sure there were, four, there were fresh soldiers for each watch. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Just a tiny little moment here at the end of verse five. The church met together and had a prayer meeting. This is Peter. This is, the, this is the top leader in the Jerusalem church. He is precious to them. And Peter has been arrested. They don't want him to go the way of James. And, and the thing with James just happened. There's got to be fear there. And so they hold a large prayer meeting in the home of John Mark's mother, Mary. This was probably the center meeting place of church life at that time. And while they prayed, it says they prayed earnestly. That word earnestly there, it's an important word in the Greek. It's ektenos. It was a medical term. And the medical term describes when you stretch out a limb so far to its almost breaking point. You're stretching the muscle. You're so earnest in your reach for a particular thing is the idea. This is how earnestly, how passionately they're praying. Verse six, the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. And this is the first point of comedy in the picture, in the story, is everybody's praying earnestly. The idea is they were probably up all night long. Guess who's snoring? Peter. Peter. He's the guy in jail. He's literally chained both sides to two different guards. Do you think that was a comfortable situation? Probably not. He's supposed to be put on trial and likely killed the very next day, the same way that James had been killed. How in the world is this man so at peace, so no anxiety, not worried, totally settled? that he's sitting there and he's sleeping. That little detail there is important. Amen. How could you sleep at a time like that? Uh, he's sleeping because of this. Because Jesus had told him in the book of John, after the resurrection, he had had this one-on-one -on -one conversation with Peter. And Jesus had told him, he said, Peter, someday when you are old, that's the first detail. When you are old, some people will take you where you don't want to go and they will stretch out your hands. And by that, Jesus indicated that Peter was going to be crucified. The detail about that is that crucifixion was a Roman execution. He's been captured by Herod. Herod was going to execute by beheading. 
So Peter's in this situation. He's not old yet, according to Jesus' words. He's not, he's not arrested by the Romans. Peter knows he's not dying tomorrow. So as bad as everything looks on the surface... Peter's got the promise of Jesus on exactly how this is going to go down. And this ain't it. And so he's snoozing. There's something about when you've so securely given your life and your death to Jesus Christ, you can sleep in the middle of difficult situations. Remember Jesus sleeping in the boat in the middle of the storm and the disciples are waking him up saying, how dare you be sleeping right now? We're all going to die. There is a peace that leads you through the storm. Do you have that peace? Boy, we struggle with that, don't we? It's an election year, amen? A lot of us are losing sleep already, and we're not even near November yet. I know. (laughs) Where can we get our security? Our security comes from a surrender of our life and our death to Jesus Christ. That's where it comes from. And then all of a sudden we find that we're sleeping when no one else is. Peter was asleep. I love that. Verse 7, suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter and the angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Now, first off, the angel appears and a bright light fills the cell. And then the angel has to hit him in the side to wake him up. Why do you have to hit him in the side to wake him up? Because he was sleeping. Like you showed up, bright light. You think the guy's going to wake up. Uh Uh-uh, he's sleeping deep, right? Now you got to hit him. And then then the angel makes his chains fall away. This angel's got superpowers, amen? Amen. Uh, He's got got light. He's got the ability to, to do away with handcuffs. And all of this while the guards do not see what's happening. The angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did now put on your coat and follow me. The angel ordered. So the the guards somehow do not know what's going on. Verse nine. So Peter left the cell following the angel, but all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening to him. Verse 10, they passed the first and second guard posts and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street and then the angel suddenly left him. This is a lot going on. Like the angel's got a lot of power. This is an amazing thing that's just taken place there. Why in the world did the first two guards not even notice that he got up and walked away? Why did they hear nothing, see nothing, feel nothing? They should have felt all of it. And then the two guards that were at the gate as well also should have stopped him. Somehow they do not know what's going on. This is Jedi mind trick stuff on the angel's part, (laughs) right? These are not the droids you're looking for. It's like, how did that even work? I don't know, but the angel just did it. God gave the angel that power. Angels do stuff, amen? Amen. Angels do stuff, yep to show Star Wars on the screen on Father's Day. It warms my heart, warms my heart. Um, That's my one dad joke of the day right there. No more. Yeah, right. (laughs) All right, verse 11. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. So Peter says, I just got saved from Herod. Now, of course, he knew that was the case, but just ask yourself the question that was still on his mind. Why did I get saved and James didn't? Why one and not the other? You ever been in that situation in your life? God, why did they get blessed and we didn't get blessed? Why did this person die of cancer and this person recovered? In this situation, don't you think the church prayed just as earnestly for both of them? Yeah. Do you think James was somehow more sinful than Peter? I don't think it was based on one of them deserved and the other one didn't. But isn't that the weird stuff that we do in our minds and our own lives? Yeah. So we start thinking, well, I didn't get the miracle because I offended God like this. Don't do that. God made a decision about James and he made a decision about Peter. What I believe with my whole heart is that James had done his work on this earth and it was time 
for him to go home. And God determined that. And Peter, it was not his time. And he had more work to do. And as we go throughout the rest of the book of Acts, you're going to see Peter had more work to do. And if you are God's person, and if you've got more work to do in God's will, then you are invincible until that moment happens. This is our faith. Verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. And he knocked at the door in the gate and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. And when she recognized Peter's voice, so she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter's standing at the door. <laughs> then why didn't you let him in? But she just, she gets so kind of freaked out in the moment. Isn't this humanity? Isn't this the kind of stuff that we do sometimes? So much excitement. It's not what you expected. Such a surprise. You just run back in and you leave the poor convict outside. And that's what she did. Um, I, I, I think moments like this aren't just written for humor, guys. I think they're written. This is so important. Dr. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is writing truth here. Scripture is real. And these kinds of moments are reminders to me that if someone hundreds of years after the existence of Jesus Christ had decided to make up a faith, they would not have written moments like this in. This is someone who's describing the reality, the humanity, the weirdness of just real life. And Dr. Luke gives us that authentic, messy history. Verse 15, you're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided, well, it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking because they'd left him outside. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. That Tell James and the other brothers what happened, what he says there. That is not the same James at the beginning of the chapter who had died, one of the original 12 disciples. This is another James. This is James, likely the James, the brother of Jesus, who becomes the leader after Peter of the Jerusalem church and writes the book of James in the New Testament. This is likely Jesus' brother, or at least half-brother. Go tell James. It's interesting. And this is the big thing I'm going to make out of today's message, the big application we're going to pull out of today's message. The praying church doesn't believe. The praying church gathered there, they're praying that he might be released, but they don't actually believe that he will. Because when he shows up, they don't believe it. When evidence that God has answered their prayers shows up in front of them, they still don't believe the evidence that they're given. Isn't that amazing? So often we pray and, and we don't have the luxury of somebody taking a spiritual x-ray of our hearts in that very moment to say, what's your faith level right now? Their faith level is pretty low. They might, have, they might have said, well, we believe God can. We believe God's able. We absolutely believe that. But we just saw James get killed. And it rattled us. So we believed that God could. We just didn't know that God would. Ever been in that spot? God can. I'm just not sure he will. So we're going we're gonna to wrestle with this today. The next morning, and this is the rest of the chapter. Feel free to read it on your own. Herod discovers that Peter has escaped. He has all the guards executed, which I think is super unfair because it was them against a Jedi angel, and there's no way they had a chance. All right, time for a bacon break, amen? Let's go. Here they come. You could applaud them as they walk in. Um, this is our moment. Um, this is how we celebrate Father's Day here at Grace Fellowship Church. You can see on the screens. Oh, thank you very much. You can see on the screens, this is our crispy crew. Greg, Matt, Zach, and I can't see who's behind that. Oh, there's Morgan Graham is also there. Um, 
These guys have been cooking all morning since 8 a.m. They'll be cooking until noon today. So if you walk out there and you see them hard at work, give them a hug, tell them thank you. We're super happy about all of this today. Um, as they're passing the bacon down your row, um, it doesn't matter if you're a dad or not. Um, you, please just take a, a, a piece of bacon. The only thing I ask, um, sometimes this goes on too long, um, don't spend a lot of time finding the perfect piece. I know how tempting that is, but just grab one and let it go by. Also, it's our tradition that I get a little piece of bacon up here and usually choke each year. So that was just the one year. Okay, little story. We don't have time for this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. The first year that we ever did this, we went to El Rodeo and we actually had them thick slice uh, pork butt. Oh, it was so good. It was so good. Um, but I choked for real that year because they were like mini pork chops basically up here. Um, so this is better. Still thick bacon. Thick enough? Good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so enjoy the bacon. After the service today, we've got a kind of a classic, beautiful truck downstairs. That's meant to be our photo booth. So go down, take dad down there, whether he wants to go or not. Amen. And get yourself a Father's Day picture. It's going to be great. So they're still passing out bacon. I'm going to preach while you eat because I get paid for this. Um, all right. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Uh, golly. I'm having a good time second service. I don't know what it is. You're all so pretty, that's why. Um, okay, let's go back to the church that prayed for Peter. This is our point today. They prayed and they didn't actually believe. Why not? They believed God could, they just didn't believe God would. It even says they prayed earnestly, by the way. You might, you might look at this situation and say, well, maybe they were just autopiloting their prayer. You ever do that? You ever go to a prayer meeting and you're saying all the right words, but your heart isn't in it at all. I think we've all been there. But these guys were praying earnestly. I mean, all their emotion is in it. The only thing that's missing is their faith. And here's the crazy grace idea, too, in the midst of it. And don't miss this. This is a super theological moment. They're praying without faith. And God still does the miracle. Woo! Those of you who've been taught like ultra faith, charismatic, kind of like it must be this level of faith or God won't move, you got to put that in your pipe and smoke it because that's really going to mess with you. <laughs> Seriously, it's almost like God likes to find where our rules are and then he likes to break them because he doesn't want us to be religious people that put God in a box. I'm getting serious now. Yes, we do that. He comes into this group of people who don't even believe when Peter shows up and he does the miracle anyway. Why? Because he's good. Because he's good. You remember the man that came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Yeah. And he brings this, this messy kind of immature faith to Jesus and Jesus still does the miracle. God calls us to believe. Don't miss that. God calls us to believe and he wants our faith and he wants us to grow in our faith. But he'll still do the miracle. We all live by faith every day. Inside of prayer and outside of prayer. We all live by faith. Every single time you go to a restaurant, you live by faith, yes? Amen. When they bring food to your table, you have a whole lot of faith about what happened in that kitchen and you don't know. You didn't see it. And depending on some of the restaurants that you go to, it's more faith than others, yes? Every single time you drive down the road and you go around a sharp turn that's a blind turn, what are you having faith in? You're having faith that everybody's obeying the rules of the road and you're not going to crash into anybody coming around the turn. Amen. You have faith that last surgery that you had when they put you under. You have no idea what happened when you were under, what they took out of your body, what they put into your body and sewed you back up. You don't know right? You walked by faith. You came in this morning, you sat in that chair and you did not inspect the chair for structural integrity. You just had faith. And so we use faith all the time, but sometimes our faith gets rattled like their faith got rattled because James had been killed. Some of 
Some of our faith in this room, it's been rattled because you've prayed for things in the past and they didn't come about. You were disappointed in God. And that struggle has left you with a temperamental trust. But the church was praying. They knew God could. They just didn't believe that he would. Let's talk about how this works, this temperamental trust. Um, when my kids were young, we had a Dairy Queen uh, located just four blocks from our house. And, and I'm not exaggerating. It was just four blocks and there were sidewalks the entire way. It was like a yellow brick road. It was like inviting us every single day to go to Dairy Queen. And this thing was beautiful. It was like an old 1950s Dairy Queen right in the center of town. And you'd see everybody there because we were all addicted to ice cream. It was amazing. So anyway, there were a lot of nights where we're sitting there at the family dinner table. And our kids are eating like hoping that we'll go to ice cream at some point that evening. And a lot of times the answer was yes. And we had a great time. But some days, the answer was no. Why? Because we weren't made of money. Sometimes we didn't have the money to do it that often. And, and we did care about the kids' teeth because some of you are judging me right now, looking at me like I'm a bad parent. But it's like, no, we did care about their health. And we cared about their teeth and all that kind of stuff. So sometimes the answer was, it's been too many times this week. So the answer is no. And, and, and here's the thing. How should that conversation go? The answer is no this time. Wonderful, Dad. I totally understand. <laughs> like, there will never be ice cream again. This is so terrible. I was really looking forward to it. Yeah, like, you know how this goes. And you might look at that and say, well, that's kids being kids. And you'd be right. Like when you're three years old or four years old, that kind of temperamental trust where all of a sudden everything falls apart because of one disappointment. Like that's the way that it works with us. That makes sense at three and four years old. It just stops making sense at 30. Because what should we be growing into? A stronger trust, right? Yeah. We should be growing in in our relationships, growing into a stronger trust of our parents. We say, no, dad's generous and dad loves me. And so if tonight the answer is no, that's okay. There's a reason. I'm going to trust. And then I'm going to come back the next night and I'm going to ask again and see if the answer is yes that time. And then an, an asking and, a, and an expecting and a persistence starts to become part of a, a stable trust relationship. And that's the way it's supposed to work. And sometimes we don't grow into that the way that we should. Even in our marriages, some of us really struggle with anxiety and fears about the fidelity of the other person. Even if they've earned through faithfulness our trust See, when we're, we're in a good, healthy relationship and they act trustworthy over time, then we should give them trust. And sometimes even because of our past, maybe it's difficult to extend trust even to someone who's trustworthy, but we need to. We got away in our culture sometimes of, of saying, well, this is my past and this is my brokenness. And so this is just the way I am. Please accept me for the way I am. And, and that's partly true. Can I just say that? It's okay to not be okay. But God the Father loves you too much to leave you there. Amen. It's okay to have broken trust. It's okay for trust to be a struggle for you in all of your relationships. But don't just stop there. Amen. Waiting for more and more people to acknowledge your pain while you don't try to move forward in growth. It's a both and thing. They should acknowledge your pain and your past and the difficulty. But you should also expect growth. And it's going to take courage and it's going to take risks and, and it's not easy. And this is the same thing in our relationship with God, yes? It's not about a temperamental trust, even though there's days that we pray with that temperamental trust. And we get really disappointed and we struggle to believe him in the future because he said no to ice cream once before. We don't want to ask again. But God longs for us to grow in that. So let's talk about it a little bit more. God's nature is that God is faithful 
It's a, it's a word that we don't talk about a whole lot. God is faithful. In the Hebrew, that's emet. He is emet. Say emet. Emmet, God is Emmet. He is, he is faithful. So this is what he told Moses when he revealed his character to Moses. He said, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and Emmet and faithfulness, Hallelujah. trustworthiness, dependability. I speak truth only. I make promises and keep them only. I am faithful. I am steady. I am rock is what he says there. And then we are called to enter into a relationship with someone like that. Here's another example of Emmet. This is a time when Moses and the Israelites are fighting against a foreign nation called the Amalekites. And in the midst of that fight between the two of them, um, Moses begins to pray and lift up his hands. Do you remember that story from Sunday school? He lifts up his hands. And as he prays, lifting up his hands, the army of Israel begins to win against the Amalekites. And as Moses' arms start to come down because he's tired, they start to lose against the Amalekites. And so Aaron and Hur see that happening and they run over and they put a stone underneath uh, Moses' bum so that he can sit down and rest. And then they hold up his arms on both sides of him to keep his arms up. And then the scripture says, so his hands held Emmet until sunset. They held steady. They held faithful. They held strong. Here's the third one. God is steady. Even amidst giants. God had told them that they were going to go into the promised land. And so they sent 12 spies in right as they got to the border. And the spies came back and said, I don't know if our army is going to be able to defeat the army that's in the promised land because they're full of giants. And they were super afraid. And that fear spread to the rest of the Israelite people. And they all said, we're so afraid of going in there that we won't win the battle, that we're not going to go forward. And God took it very personally. He said, it's, it, it's their distrust in this moment isn't just a personal thing. It's personal with me. So here are God's words. He says, how long will these people treat me with contempt or dishonor or unbelief? Will they never believe me? That's that Emmet word there. Will they never give me acknowledgement that I'm trustworthy? Even after all the miraculous signs that I have done among them. Israel had been freed by God from Egypt. He had parted the Red Sea for them. He had done miracle after miracle. Manna had come every single day in the desert for them. They were, they were faced with miracles every single day. And they come to this moment, and there's such a temperamental trust in them that they're like, but we don't believe God will help us here because there's giants. Do you see? And God's like, I've earned this trust. Amen. And they're, they're treating me like a liar who has never spoken anything but truth. They're treating me as unstable when I've only ever been rock solid for them. And I don't think in this moment that this is God angry with them. I think he is full of grace toward us. But they are stuck. To be in that place is to be stuck in an unhealthy place of immaturity. And God calls us to more. And so when you see the church and they don't believe that Peter's even alive because they have not been praying with faith the whole time, it's like, I get it, I've been there, but you guys are stuck. And you need to step into more. 400 years after that point, a shepherd boy named David came along faced one of those exact giants that the other people were afraid of 400 years later named Goliath. And he said these words to Goliath. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. And he flings some stones at that guy and he wins. Why? Because faith isn't just about feelings. Faith is about feet. It's about moving it's about taking a step of faith in the direction of God. Faith moves. Faith walks. Faith takes action. 
It's not about in your prayer life, you just trying to manage your feelings toward God. That's not what it's about. That actually doesn't work. But it's you being willing to take action. Again, praying every single day about ice cream and not losing heart, that's action. That's feet. And it's like, how many times throughout the scripture did people need to take action? You remember Peter being in the boat and Jesus is walking on the water and Peter decides to get out of the boat and walk on water himself? That's feet. It's like the rest of the disciples in the boat, do they believe? We don't know, but we know about Peter's faith because he walked. So what's that for you? What's the action you need to take? Daniel chapter three, verse 16. Here's another group of people who walked in in a way that not only God can, but God will. God can and God will. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Rack, Shack, and Benny, according to Veggie Tales, if you you follow that. So here's what happened is you had Israel was taken into captivity and you've got these three very, very young people might have been late teens, even early 20s, um, Jewish men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and all of a sudden, the king builds this very large statue of himself, and he wants everybody in the kingdom to bow down to it all at once. And there's three of these gentlemen standing, refusing to bow to it. And so Nebuchadnezzar gets right in their face and says, if you don't bow, I'm going to throw you in a furnace, and you will burn alive. And that's the threat he makes to them. And their response to him, Daniel 3, 16, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Faith has feet. They took action. And look at their words, amazing Our God can do it, he's able. And our God will do it, we expect him to. Why? Because he loves us and he protects us and he's generous toward us. Why wouldn't we expect it? But even if he doesn't, even if today is a day that this particular prayer gets disappointed, I'm gonna trust him anyway. If it's his will that I walk into that furnace, let's go. Amazing faith. What a phrase. Our God can, our God will, but even if he doesn't, I'll trust him. Can you try that? Our God can, our God can, our God will, our God will, but even if he doesn't, come on, even if he doesn't, I'm going to trust him. Our God can, our God will, but even if he doesn't, I will trust him. That's an amazing prayer for a hospital bedside. Our God can, and our God will. But even if he doesn't, I'm going to trust him. Because even if the answer is not yes today, I'm going to ask again tomorrow because he's good to me and I expect him to do good things. I don't have a temperamental trust. I've got a solid, strong trust, hoping that it's growing in God. But if that's the case, then I'm voting with my feet and I'm praying every day. It's, It's when I stop praying and, man, I've been there. I can't tell you how much I've been there. I prayed so many years already and the answer has been no or it's been wait and sometimes it's hard to keep going but stubbornly with your strong trust in a God who's earned it with you trust him the book of James it says you have not because you ask not it's, it's an amazing moment in scripture he says there are blessings in your life that you could have had but you didn't ask God for those blessings. And so those blessings have not come about. And that's, you, you guys who are philosophical in the audience, that's really gonna mess with you. But the idea there is, there were blessings that could have been in your life last week that you didn't ask for. And so you have not enjoyed them. There were blessings yesterday that God was making available to you. You're like, well, why didn't he just pour them all out? Like, just give them to me, God, if, if they're there. Because God has tied his blessings to prayer. It has been his good pleasure to tie some of his miracles to prayer. Why? Because it tethers your heart to his heart. Amen. There is something about prayer 
that causes you to keep going to the Father, to keep remembering him, to build your relationship with him, that he is your source. And it drives you, and he knew that about us. But what he says is, he says, keep asking. I know I said no before, but keep asking. It wasn't the right time. I had my reasons. I'll explain it all someday, maybe. But keep asking and don't stop. Amen. Right? Because it's, it's in the not stopping that we get closer to him. And watch this. It's in the not stopping that you'll start to see more blessings come into your life. And I'm not making weird promises to you, okay? I'm just quoting James here. There are things, more miracles that will start to flow into your life not to make you better than anybody else, but to increase your faith and connection to God. Amen. There's some old saints around here that have got an amazing faith of expectation with Jesus. And part of it is they don't stop praying. And as they don't stop praying, they have all these miracles come in. And so they've got so many yeses in their life that God has given to them. And so when some no's come along, they're not so temperamental about it. Because it's built them up. That's how it works. Our God can, our God will, but even if he doesn't, I will trust him. Resilience. Years ago, when I was in my early 20s, uh, my grandmother, we called her Nana, was in a coma. And she had been in a coma in the hospital for a long time. It had been well over a month. It's too far in the past. I, f I forget exactly how long she was in there. But she was in so long, you stopped expecting to talk to her again. You figured this is just it. And, I mean, we're, we're still there every single day, and we're a tight family. And my grandfather, who is this amazing guy, elder in the church, man of God, uh, fought in World War II, Army veteran, just amazing. I can't tell you how much respect I have for him. But it just so happened there was this one day we were at the hospital and it was just him and me in this family waiting room. And he broke down crying in front of me, which you didn't see him do very often. And he said, Josh, is it time for me to just give up? Is it time for me to stop praying? And and I was just a young punk, okay? I had just started reading the scripture. I had just started walking with God. I had no right for this man to ask me such a question. But it's just where we were, and it's just where he was. And I just, in my quiet time, had been reading about King David. And there was a moment where King David, God had told him one of his kids was going to die. That's a complicated story. But David fasted and he prayed and he refused to eat and he was, he was just charging at heaven asking for a reprieve from this. Sackcloth and ashes and he would not be comforted or consoled. And some of his servants were starting to get worried about him. And they're like, why don't you stop? And he's like, I will not stop because God might change his mind. And there was just this stubbornness in David all the way into the moment that his child died. And so just put on the spot by him in that family waiting room, I was like, Grandpa, I just read about David doing this. And he didn't give up until it was over, over. So I think we just do what David did. Yes. And we don't stop until it's over, over. And so we did. And we started praying again. And no lie, not making this up, like two days later, I'm sitting in the hospital room and like some dumb 60 minutes program comes on and they're just announcing to people, they're like, you know, there's this thing that'll happen if you mix this medication and a person with this medication and a person, you can't have them both on these two treatments at the same time. And I just knew, because we've been in the hospital room so much and just hearing the nurses talk, I knew grandma was on one of them. And I'm like, somebody checked the chart. They got her on this other one they just talked about, and they did. I know that sounds silly, but we went and talked to the nurses about it. 
And of course, they're acting like none of this is a problem. And they're not admitting to anything. Two days later, grandma's eyes open up. And she's talking to us. And we got years with her after that. Uh Uh-huh. And we didn't sue the hospital, I promise. What's the point, though? The point... The point was God brought us to a place where we're like, we're going to keep praying. We're going to keep asking. Our God can and our God will. And even if he doesn't, we'll still trust him. But faith has feet, guys. And so if we believe he can and we believe he will, we better get to asking. So if you're in the room today and like, like I used to pray this thing and then I gave up because God had not said yes yet. And, and I, now it's time to start again. It's time to hope again. It's time to believe again. Amen? Why don't you guys stand up? Lord Jesus, I pray for a restoration of faith all across this room. I pray, Lord, that we could ask. Lord, we're not so strong in our hearts that we can make things happen. We're not trying to make things happen. But we are asking our good father. And Lord, you've earned our trust time and time and time again, Lord. You've come through for us, not just in human history, but in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would give you the trust that you deserve. Now, Lord, I pray that you call us back to prayer, to this adventure of asking you for big things and watching you come through. Jesus, show us that kind of life in Christ's name. Amen.